Today's program is called Past Lives, Present Lives, a dialogue where Tim Murphy interviews Stephen McCulley. Stephen has written seven novels, including his latest, My Ex-Life. His best-known novel is The Object of My Affection, which was made into a movie starring Jennifer Aniston and Paul Rudd. Since 1987, he has taught at UMass, Harvard University, and most frequently at Brandeis University, where he co-directs the creative writing program with poet Elizabeth Bradfield. His favorite place to write is the Provincetown Library. <laughs> Our interviewer, Tim Murphy, is the author of novels Christadora and forthcoming correspondence that's supposed to that's coming out in 2019. Not supposed to, it is. Who knows what could happen between now and then? He's also a longtime journalist focusing on HIV AIDS and LGBTQ issues for thus dot, for them dot us, pause, the body dot com, the nation, the New York magazine, Brown Alumni Monthly, and other publications. He is also a member of the activist group Gays Against Guns. He was raised in Boston area and lives in Brooklyn, but he is happiest when he's on Route 6 on his frequent trips to Provincetown. Yes. Yes. We all know that moment. Yes. 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 Please help me welcome them both and for the conversation. So thank you all for coming. I just want to say, uh, I, I asked Stephen to, oh, should we have to use these for the like, technical purposes? Are they on? Is it? Oh, there. Okay. So, <laughs> that, can I just like? On the, on the desk, yeah. Work. Okay. All right. Is yeah. that good? That is yeah. good. Okay. All right. And you, Stephen, is yours on? Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Is that on? No. No, no, it wasn't. Oh. That's good. All right. Say something. No, it's not on. Um, there we go. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. Yeah. I really Can don't have anything important to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's one, one in the middle. Since we will only okay, no, be we will only be duetting at certain key points. So <laughs> <laughs> most of the time, we want to talk. Just don't um, get the microphones too close together. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Again for ninety minutes. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say I am so happy to be here. Nan, the founder, asked me to read the, the first year of the festival when my book, Christador, came out. And it was so exciting being part of a brand new festival in a place that I love so much, that has such an incredible literary and artistic tradition that I said to Nan, I'm on this ride with you and I want to help you you know, program and, and build this festival. And Nan has shown such a commitment to bringing an ever larger and more diverse roster of writers here every year. I'm just dazzled at the at the list this year. And I really just want to hand it to you, Nan, because like, you've really committed a full, you know, I also really just want to say, when I heard that you had booked Stephen, I, I said, can I interview <laughs> him? Because the object of my affection was such a, you know, I was in high school, college at that time, and it was such a seminal <laughs> writer. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in fourth grade. <laughs> First full you know book that I read no. <laughs> <laughs> well, after it's, Judy Bloom. It's kind of like a fourth grade level. So <laughs> it was, it was a great place, place to start. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's kind of like um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that you know that I remember distinctly like the, the object of my affection, uh, a home at the end of the world by Michael Cunningham, and also the mysteries of Pittsburgh by Michael Chabon, who to my knowledge is not gay, but that was. If I remember correctly, there was a very important gay character or like a gay relationship. Those three books were in very seminal for me, you know, as someone who was contemplating being a writer because they, they sort of, they signaled that it's okay now to be an openly gay writer and to write about gay lives, especially in the context of other lives, you know, of gay people sort of woven into, uh, you know, families and, and social circles, and you know, they were just incredibly influential books. And it's it's really striking how books often give young, younger or you know forthcoming writers permission to write the kind of book that they want. Like it, it signals it is now okay to write about this kind of stuff. 
So, um, you know, I just wanted to say, and you know, and then I'll just say, I loved this new book. This this new book, My Ex Life, is so funny. It is so funny. It is like Jane Austen slash Oscar Wilde funny. Like <laughs> such are the aphorisms come so fast and furious. That's, I where, was, that's those are the people I stole most of them from. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah you did a good job is. of thinly veiled. Yeah. yeah, and I wanted to ask you about that later actually. But um, <laughs> I was howling, you know, reading the book on the, on like Kindle on the subway. and. I was howling writing it actually, but not. I, I would hope that you would. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's 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 incredible, and it's it's also very moving. And I have things I want to ask you about it, but I want for you first to read it from it a bit for those who haven't read it. Who ha who has not read it? Look at how I'm. Oh, I don't yeah. think there are enough copies out there. For the books, <laughs> because, <you know. laughs> um, so, but some have. Okay, so I just wanted those who haven't to have a taste. So, get well, it. well, anyway, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and being, you know, to be a part of this festival. This literally is um, kind of my favorite place to write. Um, a couple of years ago, when I had the beginning of this novel, um, and had sold the novel based on the first 90 pages. I came to Province Town for, um, you know, three weeks in May after Brandeis got out and, um, and you know, thought, oh man, I am never going to finish this novel, you know, like, like literally, uh, never finish it. And, um, and I was renting a place right down the street and I came to this library and went up to the third floor and sat at one of those um, wonderful tables with an amazing view of the harbor and I thought, by the end of the day, yeah, maybe I can, you know, so, and, and it really is my favorite place to write, so thank you. And also, it's such a great honor to um, speak with Tim because um, I read Christodora this summer and it's just like the most amazing novel. I mean, I feel like, well, I'm not going to say, you should buy that one instead of my Because it's really um, <clears throat> an incredibly beautiful, complicated, um, powerful novel, and um, so anyway, it's an art. So yeah, anyway, yeah. okay. So um, I was just talking to the amazing writer Jamie Brenner, who is here, who writes a novel a year, and my schedule has been more like one every five years, except the previous novel to this one was one was eight years ago, and um, so like a lot happens between the publication of books. Like you publish one book in 2010, and you know, you're living in a functioning democracy. And, um, <laughs> you know, years later, I don't know. Um, and one of the things that happened in publishing is that, like, the publisher set up these readings and so on, and they're very excited about it. And they said, "But we just want to make sure you understand that whatever you do with the readings, um, don't read." And I said, oh, "Like, really? Just because?" And they said, um, "No, like, write." Pe re People don't want to hear reader writers read at readings anymore. Um, they want you to talk. Um, and then a couple of days later, she said, "Oh, do you want to do a talk at this different kind of venue?" And I didn't, so I said yes. And um, <laughs> and I said, but, "You know, what would I talk about?" And she said, "Oh, they don't want you to talk. They want you to read." <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I kind of figure like neither one of those things. People don't want to hear writers talk or read, um, but we're going to do both. <laughs> so I'm just going to read for I'm going to read for a couple of minutes um, a very abridged version of the just opening pages of this novel. Um, no, it was not the happiest moment of David Hedge's life. Soren, his partner of five years, had left him. He'd gotten fat, and somewhere in the midst of that, he'd woken up one day and realized he was no longer in his 20s or his 40s. <laughs> <laughs> the last person he expected to hear from was Julie Fisk. He and Julie had a history, albeit an ancient and complicated one. They hadn't seen each other in almost 30 years, hadn't spoken in more than 20, and David assumed that their story, like a few other things in his life, his desire to visit Petra, his vow to study piano, his sexual relevance, had ended. This didn't diminish her importance to him. His memories of her lingered on, faded by the years in flattering ways. In his mind, they were still best friends. He heard of Julie Fisk infrequently, through a few mutual friends, and had pieced together scraps and come to the conclusion that she had a happy life. She taught art at a private school for kids with learning problems, not what she'd imagined for herself in her younger incarnation, but who was he to judge? 
They'd been in touch sporadically for a while after the divorce, and then she'd met and eventually married Henry Bell, an investment advisor David had had the pleasure of never meeting. <laughs> David wasn't good at making money with money, and he was suspicious of people who were, especially when they did it with other people's money and activity he equated with plagiarism. Over the years, David had thought of trying to see her when he went east to visit family, but he'd never followed through. The period of life they'd shared was his ex-life, and he was resigned to leave it at that. And then one day, during that season of his aggrieved discontent, he received a phone call from Julie Fisk that changed everything. And that's kind of the setup of the, the story and the, you know, um, sort of, you know, a background and all that. Um, and the novel is told more or less from three points of view, from David's, his ex-wife's point of view, Julie, and um, Julie's 17-year-old uh, daughter, um, who has, whose name is Mandy. She has the misfortune of having been named after a Barry Manilow song. <laughs> <laughs> humiliation for which she will never forgive her parents. So. That's the book. <laughs> That's where it starts, right? And that is sort of what begins to bring David and uh, Julie back together yeah. right after this protracted. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, in, I guess I'll keep invoking the goddess Austen many times, but, um, you know, like it, like Jane Austen's novels, your novels are, uh, they're always sort of variations on a theme. There are some certain uh, court things. There's usually a gay male protagonist who's the storyteller, who's the center, and then uh, these people swirling around him and the, the uh, foibles. Did I pronounce that? That's one of those I words you so. like yeah. see often no. but never use. It's yeah. not quabble or no. No. <laughs> right, of their lives. And everyone's life is sort of a mess. Um, and, uh, you know, also what I, what I love is that there's never, um, or, you know, at least in my recollection of the ones, there's never like a perfect bow at the end. You know, there's always kind of like a broken closure or something. Um, so. You know, like you were saying, you've you've written a book about every what five years or so yeah. since the object of my affection, yeah. right? In nineteen eighty-seven, yeah. that came out. So, what was um, for this one? What were um, you know? It's sort of taking the same core, yeah. right? Or maybe the same core structure every time, but you're going to do different twists, right? You're going to put it in a different frame, etc. What were the um, you know, when you were thinking about writing this book, what were the animating new things that you wanted to bring to it? Um, you know, I, I think that, I don't know how animating it is, it, it's actually maybe more enervating, but um, <laughs> is one of the things is just um, the difference in the, the needs and the uh, expectations of the characters that the, uh, now that they are a little, that they are older, that they are in their early 50s, I think is how old they are, I can't remember. Um, but um, that, you know, the expectations for relationships, um, for friendships, for um, intimacy are different. Um, at, I mean, at, at that core, they may be somewhat the same, but um, as one gets older, one um, changes um, in terms of needs and expectations. And I think that was kind of one of the things that I wanted to explore. But I mean, Airbnb is like a big, theme in the book, right? <laughs> so are there, and That's I, true. Did that come partly from, I think I read in some bios of you, that you, you've you been in the Airbnb, that's sort of a side gig for you, right? Uh, <laughs> it's in your bio. It's in your oh, it is? bio, oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, I think it's on the book jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I would change that <laughs> if it was if it was just, Well, I mean, I have a very kind of ambivalent relationship to Airbnb, which is that, you know, I mean, whenever I, the way I write is I go places like Provincetown or, you know, Burlington, Vermont or Northampton or someplace um, and um, rent an Airbnb and, um, and then go to the library and write. And really, somehow, it wouldn't work if it was like a hotel because A, it's more expensive and B, you can't cook. And um, so, you know, I'm very dependent upon Airbnb and I kind of love it. Um, and because it's more expensive now than it used to be, um, I have a couple of 
properties that I rent out on Airbnb to fund my own renting of other properties. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do the same. I do the, do I've been on both ends of the Airbnb equation <coughs> for quite a few years now. Okay. Yeah. Where's your, where are your rentals? <laughs> I mean, I just have a little, a little tiny house up in upstate New York. Oh, wow. I Airbnb. Well, we'll talk about that. It's near Hudson. Okay. You know that town, Hudson? Yeah, I know. spent the summer in Saugerties. So. Oh, okay. So nearby. Yeah, nearby. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I actually love the feeling of like, I don't know, I think because writing is so, um, it's very 1D, you know, you're just yeah. in front of a screen. And I actually love that I have this little job that's like a 3D job where I have to go and buy like three months worth of paper towels right, and right. like toilet paper. It makes me feel very normal and real, you're in you the know, world. like I'm in the real world. <laughs> yeah. you know? and, uh, yeah, so that's been nice for, um, you know, I think that my father's biggest disappointment in me was that I didn't know how to do normal things like parallel park or, <laughs> you know, fix something. So that makes me feel like I'm, I don't know, You don't have a parallel park? For no, I do. I'm actually oh, really okay. good now. Yeah, he'd be proud if he could see okay. me. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah, that's one of his <laughs> bitterest disappointments. Anyway, but we're, we're <laughs> veering way too, <laughs> way too deep into time. But this is the kind of stuff right. I want to know, you know. <laughs> uh, I'll, give, I'll throw you crumbs here and there. Okay. So, Looping back. Okay, so Airbnb. <coughs> um, yeah. Well, no, but so you know, one thing that you know, if you look at all of the, I did not write this book because I wanted to write about Airbnb. It just right. Kind of happened. It just fell in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Um, what about in terms of tone? You know, like as I was looking back through reviews and the Goodreads of all the your books between, of which there are many. Right. There's this is your seventh. Yeah. Right. It's actually my ninth because I wrote two on. <coughs> Pseudonym. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. what's but that I don't pseudonym really, again? I'm not telling you. <laughs> the whole thing is Are too they porn? <laughs> no, that's the embarrassing thing. They're not porn. Um, <laughs> I, well, exactly. That's why? why I don't want to talk about them. <laughs> they're yoga books. They're books about um, yoga. I mean, no, they're books set at a yoga studio in Los Angeles. And, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Now you just blew open a whole new. Yeah. A line of questioning? Yeah, okay. right. Yeah. So I'm going to just, okay. I'm going to table that, put it over here. <laughs> um, okay, but if you look at the books under your, I presume your real name, yeah. right? Stephen <laughs> Where did you grow up? I grew up in um, Woburn, Massachusetts. Anyone from there? Oh my God. Did anyone read or see the movie A Civil Action <coughs> about the poison yeah. wells, yeah. John Travolta, yeah. blah, blah, blah? Oh, yeah. That's the town I grew up in. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I feel like and I grew up very, Yeah, I grew up very close to there in, like, in, in North Andover. So, oh, God, wow. the, uh, I know, right? <laughs> Everyone I know is, is, is okay, okay to my knowledge, but it's quite, it's oh, quite devastating. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of blowing my mind. Because um, yeah. a lot of the homes hit were right in the neighborhood I grew up. Um, anyway, God, it's digressions, right? Um, but I also love, you know, I was gonna, I think there's a lot of mass, there's a very particular kind of mass hole humor, you know, like very sarcastic, to which I feel is so uh, core to your books, you know? And then I think there's actually Thanks. a lot of that. You know, I, mean it in the, I mean it in the best We've way. gone from Oscar Wilde to mass hole. <laughs> and it's been there's like a, 10 minutes. Yeah, there's more overlap than you may think. Yeah. Um, he, he would be a mass hole if he were alive today. Yeah. But, okay. If you looked at all your books, right, it's like there's some sort of an Ur story. Like you could almost say that David and Julie are um, Nina and uh, who's George. The, yeah. Nina and George. Thirty years later, you know, like presumably, if you want to look at it as an overstory, thirty years later, and they've been through all these ups and downs, and they just flat <laughs> out decide that they're happier together. You know. Yeah. Uh, did that occur to you at all? Like, were you thinking of a, a Nina and George and a David and Julie uh, parallel? You know, um, I, I've written about 50 pages of this book, and someone, and I was describing it to someone, and she said, oh, so it's a sequel to your first novel. I said, no, like, I, it never, it really never occurred to me um, at that point. And then, of course, I became very um, self-conscious about it. Um, I mean, I saw these characters as so distinctly different from those characters, um, not only because of where they are in their life, but just where they had come from um, in their lives and in their relationships, that it, it just seemed to me, um, it, it didn't feel that way at all. But 
thematically, you're absolutely right. It's kind of you know in conversation with that book, I suppose. Right. Which is not something that was intentional, really. Just um, just kind of happened. Okay. Okay. And you know, and related to that, there's there's a theme through your books of like these relations that you know. This is I really wanted to talk to you about this. Like, it's very interesting that like your gay relationships are always. It's always an X, it's always gone south, <coughs> or it's at the, you know, it's at the barren end of the relationship. You know, it's very seldom, unlike, say, Hollinghurst, where we see gay eros and passion, like, in the, the print, the, you know, and it, uh, it's like, uh, in the greatest love affair in the books is often between, like, a gay man and a straight woman. And I'm really curious, like, what, ha, ha, have you thought about that? Like, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm really curious, if, you know, because uh, I, my, you know, okay, this is getting very psychiatric, um, very quickly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay. my brand. Um, <laughs> so, what's the question? <laughs> where do you think that? Why do you think that's a trope in your books? This in, this intense sort of platonic love affair between gay men and straight women. Um, I think I have a. To me, I think there's something um, both kind of like touching and um, recklessly romanticized about those kind of relationships in a way because, um, and at the same time, they have a kind of loneliness and, and you know, irresolution, if that's a word. And I love swabbles, by the way. This <laughs> is like, this is a French. wobble. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, uh, and what was I saying? Something about <laughs> loneliness. Oh, loneliness, yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. And so there's, there's just kind of like a bitter sweetness to those relationships um, that I like writing about, that it's, it will never be resolved. It will never be entirely satisfied. You know, you kind of know that going into it. Um, I mean, it was important in this novel that um, these are, this is such a pair that had been married in an earlier incarnation in their lives. They'd been through that. And so there was no, like, um, I mean, let's be honest, like, sex is a really big motivator for all kinds of behavior in our lives, you know, because you want to get something. Like, we've all, I'm sure, like, um, painted, helped somebody paint a living room or, you know, like <laughs> carried stuff out to the moving van because you thought you were going to get something out of it, at, you know, at the end. Um, and so the, um, in the middle. Um, and so these characters um, know that that's never going to happen. And I sort of like the idea that there's a kind of purity about their kindness to each other that, that comes without expectations for, you know, some um, consummation, I guess. Is it, is it just a friendship, or is there more than, is there more to it? Is there some element of romance? Well, I mean, I, I there's a line in one of my books um, mm -hmm. where someone says, you know, that, that it's, you can't imagine having a friendship without some element of um, sexual attraction, and you can't imagine having sexual attraction without some form of, you know, friendly feelings. The latter half of that may have been put in there for convenient balance. I'm not sure that's true. Yeah, I don't know if I'd Yeah, I know, that. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but I do feel that that's true, that in most, that in many friendships, there's an element of flirtation and um, attraction of some kind that, you know, everyone knows is not going to be um, consummated, but, you know, that that exists. Don't okay. you think? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that animates, to use, a, you know, pull another, yeah. repeat another word, uh, certain friendships, right, it, that could be, in, in any situation where one person is attracted to the other and it's not vice versa. Yeah. Um, but I also wanted to ask, too, like, do you, I can't remember, like, wh why do you think, I don't think there's a there's a through line, I mean, this in a way this is sort of saying, I'm saying to a mystery writer, why isn't there more science fiction in your mystery book, but, or <laughs> vice versa, but, like, why do you think there has not been a lot of like gay passion like in your books? Like it always seems like we're hitting the like we're seeing the relationship when it's dead or when it's over. <laughs> oh well, okay. Um, you know they're autobiographical. What can I say? <laughs> I mean, dead. Um, uh, why is there no? I mean, 
I don't think that there's, for me anyway, um, I mean, I was thinking about, <clears throat> I mean, there's not a lot of explicit sex in the books either, is the, right. if that's really what you're talking about. Um, well, or passion. Or passion. Between the men. <laughs> Between the men. That's, I mean, there are a couple. <laughs> there are a few passionate moments, I suppose. Um, I mean, I think that some of it is like comedic in nature. Like, it doesn't seem to me that there's something about, that there's anything particularly humorous about great sex, you know? Whereas failed <coughs> sex strikes me as, as long as I'm not in the middle of it, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the most explicit sex scenes I've written have been sex scenes that have been disastrous, you know? Right. And, um, you know, like, I mean, I know what you're saying. Um, I'm just trying to avoid it in a way. Because I don't know. Really have an I don't know. Um, well, it's it's about the heart. It's about the most. I felt the most challenging question I wanted to ask you. So we're over the hump. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. No, but I mean, I, I think it's a totally legitimate question. But um, I also think that you know. I mean, don't you sort of, in, in many ways, you have to write about problems, right? Because if you're not writing about problems, like, well, what are you writing about? Um, nobody wants to read about a happy marriage or a happy relationship. That's why the novel, traditionally, the you know, romantic comedy, ends with the marriage of the couple. <coughs> nobody wants to know what happens after that. You know, right, Because right. <laughs> usually it's Dull. not that happy. What? Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I kind of like the contrast of, like, uh, you know, like with Christodora, I really liked the, the try to make this violent contrast between, like, the way something was or the way somebody was, you know, and I think, like, to really fully understand the death of something or the decline of something, like, you have to see it. You have to at least, you know, partly see it in its efflorescence, you know, right. like you have to see a relationship when it's in, in, in full passion. But that's a novel that, you know, had to include that, right? I mean, don't you feel that, you know, you were writing about a period of time that was uh, transformed by the AIDS epidemic and lives that were completely transformed by that, and you needed to know, I think, like, where those characters came from. Right. And, I think for me it was really important to show like I kind of feel like in gay life especially in the past years like sex and pleasure and death have are, are the two sides of the same coin you know mm -hmm. and that I really wanted to embody both to the point where like you really didn't know where one left off and like the other began so uh, you know just you know in my book like the sex scenes were really important because I really were or the scenes of hedonism you know yeah. like I really wanted you to understand that like you know, there were these uh, moments of intense pleasure and like exhilaration. But um, your sex scenes are not in that book, as I remember, are not like graphic in a sense. I mean, they're they're there are some specific, <laughs> but they're not. You know, I mean, they're not like. I mean, I'm glad you mentioned Hollinghurst because, you know, like I think he's. I mean, in addition to being like probably the best living writer, in my view, he's amazing. Um, yeah. is, is amazing. And, and he's one of the few writers who writes about sex in an extraordinarily precise and specific way that manages to be both erotic and revealing of characters and extraordinarily well written and not kind of, it doesn't, it never feels um, gratuitous, you know, it feels like right. it's all totally... Right. I mean, I do think a good sex scene should be about, like, even if the sex in the scene is good or graphic, like, the scene also should, has to be about something else. Right. You know, otherwise it's uh, porn in a way, and I'm not saying that in a negative way, but it's like, you know, that, but that exists. Porn, you know, because well, it's or not. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think, like, in the swimming pool library, like, those, I didn't never knew that a sex scene could be so... Uh, literary, or that in the context of a literary novel, you could have such incredibly hot, like right. But you're talking about Hollinghurst. It's Hollinghurst. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I'm that's not saying I mean. that I would attend. Okay. All right. So we have to pull it back into the family <laughs> realm, right? <laughs> or do we? <laughs> um, but I know I have so many more things to ask you. One is, um, I was really curious. But, but I just, can I just say one more thing about Christodor? Um, is that like 
um, you need, there were just, there's so much need for like the sex scene where the character whose name I've forgotten who gives, ultimately gives birth to, um, to um, Matteo. Yeah, yeah. Um, you need to know like how that happened and what it was like for her. I mean, it was just so much a part of her character, you know? Yeah, and I loved writing. I actually, that's a scene that I rewrote. Like originally he comes on to her uh -huh. and it just did not like, as I sat with it, it just did not feel right, you know, yeah. that it felt like in her, like, desperation for, like, love and for physical contact and, you know, her being in love with him, like, when she got drunk, she would do that and in his sort of defeated, you know, his just sort of tired, defeated, whatever he would give in and, right. like, that felt, and, you know, I mean, that's to me an example of, like, writing a sex scene that's really about, you're describing the sex, but it's there's... About other characters. things are going on, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, it's like, you know, I don't know. Like, she went into the bathroom and turned on the water and stepped under the shower. I mean, there's this like certain. Anyway, I don't know why I'm going there, but uh, well, I had a you know I had a teacher <laughs> in high school who who introduced me to Edith Wharton's porn. Oh yeah. Did you have you read that? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. And I'll, I'll always love her for that, because yeah. that was probably so inappropriate, but I mean, <laughs> doesn't everybody want to teach her like that in high school? She, there's, has anyone, has anyone read that Edith Wharton porn stuff? It's in, it's in the appendix of the um, Lewis biography, I think, of Edith Wharton. Oh, really? Which came out, there have been maybe one or two since then, but um, it's like, it's incredibly, and also it's incest porn. Really? Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's written for the no, for her novella Summer, which is like an incredibly it's like the the you know the other side of Edith Frome. Edith Frome was the winter novel, and Summer was, as you might guess, the summer novel. Um, and Ethan Frome is kind of like the anti-erotic, just you know, barren, barren. The word you recently used to describe my. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I said dead. I said dead. No, you said dead. <laughs> so anyway, um, and, and Summer was just this lush, erotic novel, and I believe that she wrote those scenes to kind of flesh out the characters in her own mind, knowing that they would never go into the published work. But oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, she leads us into my slightly more family-friendly question, okay. which is. I think because it's so hard to read your novels and not think about Jane Austen, and also in the pithiness of so many of the lines to not think about Oscar Wilde, I was really curious, who did you, who did you love, like who, who have you loved most as writers, and, or, and especially as you were growing up and before you started writing? Um, I didn't read um, Jane Austen until I was, you know, Probably in my, I mean, I shouldn't even admit this, but um, don't tell any of my <coughs> friends at Brandeis where I teach, but I, I didn't read Jane Austen until probably I was like 30 or something. Really? You know? Yeah. And when you um, did, were you like, she's me 200 years ago? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have a different sort of, you know. My psychiatrist is not as good as you, so I'm not there yet. <laughs> um, but I did Same read um, the portrait, is it the portrait or the picture of Dorian Gray? Picture. Picture um, of Dorian Gray when I was like way too young to read it and to really <laughs> understand you know, anything other than the kind of horror story aspect of it. Um, but I do think it had a profound effect on me, you know? Um, and um, because that book is just so filled with aphorisms and you know this incredible wit, and some of which shows up in different versions in some of the plays, in fact, I think. Um, and um, so uh, one would never be stupid enough to try or admit to trying to, you know, emulate that. But I'm sure it kind of influenced me in some ways. Okay, so who are your faves? So I think I mean. Like other than the Hardy Boys, uh, what, 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 that was just like, legit. <laughs> that was yeah. like a team of people. I think that was because it had this kind of undercurrent of like, you know, eroticism for me. You know, between the brothers. I think it's like <laughs> yeah, between the brothers and their friends. <laughs> and stuff. I mean, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, um, who did I like as a kid? I mean, 
I don't know, as a kid, but as a young adult, I really loved Dickens. I went through a big Dickens phase. Me too. Um, yeah. And I just loved the abundance the sprawl, of those books. Right. The sprawl, yeah. the, um, the humor, the kind of um, slightly, <clears throat> not slightly, in some cases, grossly exaggerated characters right. um, that nonetheless retain this real sense of humanity and you know psychological truth and all of that. And there's such a, uh, I don't know, social justice might be like over, you know, there's such a social element to his novels yeah. and such a sense of justice really or of, of you know, of un yeah. Fairness and yeah, no. I mean, I, that that permeates all of them, and I mean, hard times is like such a political novel. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Anyone else? Um, I'm trying to think. I'm sort of blanking out. Well, I mean, I was like very, as you might guess, I went to Woburn Public Schools. Okay. So um, I was not particularly well educated, and when I got to college, I didn't do much of anything. Um, so I was. And I came from a family where no one read, you know. Um, and like, I liked to read as a kid, and my parents were always saying, like, you know, what's wrong with you? Why don't you come out here and watch TV with the rest of us? <laughs> but really, you know. Um, and, it, and that turns out to have been like a great thing when you begin writing because you know that no one in your family is ever going to read anything. <laughs> <laughs> like, whatever you want. You know, you know, characters like, my second novel is basically, you know, about my family, really. It's the, the only yes. somewhat autobiographical novel I've ever written. And um, This is the easy, the easy Way it's Out? It's called The Easy Way yeah. Out. Yeah. And, um, uh, and no one ever read it. You know, I mean, I, no one in my family ever read it. It was a mixed so, blessing. Right? Yeah, so, so it was a mixed blessing. Yeah. Um, so, but I thought that, like, you know, well, if a book is on the bestseller list, that must mean it's great. So, like, I always thought James Mishner was like literature with a capital L when I was in high school or something, and I read those. And, and the one book I remember my mother reading was um, Valley of the Dolls, um, which like everybody read um, yeah. in you know in that period. Which is I actually. Uh, did my mother? I had an aunt who read all, of, who read all of those, yeah. you know, deliciously trashy books, and then yeah. she'd give them to my mother, who would ignore them. But I mean, I, I remember I had the exact same thing. Oh, really? Yeah, I had this aunt who read like Harold Robbins yeah. and uh, these incredibly lurid, trashy things that you know, and um, she would give them to my mother, and my mother wouldn't read them, but she did read Valley of the Dolls. That, well, which you know, I reread and wrote an essay on. Uh, just two years ago when it was the somethingth anniversary of the book. Um, it was the 50th, it came out in 66 or 7. So yeah, I wrote something. And you know, I actually think it's, I think it's such a good book on so many levels. I mean, she's so, uh, she's, it's so unpretentious. I mean, you know, she doesn't give a shit about being literary. Yeah. But the characters and the dialogue and the, and I also think the relationship between the women in the mm -hmm. book um, you know, like the friendship between um, Anne and, um, you know, the one... Neely and... Yeah, well, not Neely, but particularly the relationship between Anne and, um, you know, the beautiful... The Sharon Jennifer, Tate one. The Sharon Tate one, yeah. yeah. It's actually quite moving. And, like, there's such a sort of hustle in those books of, like... Uh, you know, they kind of reminded me of, like, Joan and Peggy on Mad Men, you know, like these girls, these ambitious girls that come to New York, and it's like, they don't care if they start as a secretary, they just want in, they just want to be in the action, they want to go out and date and go to good dinners, and, like, you know, they, and, you know, I think what I wrote in the book was that they want, they, what I love about the women is that they want love and sex, you know, and sometimes they get love and not sex, sometimes they get sex and not love, but they want both, which is, you know, such a, a rebuke to the kind of virgin whore idea of, you know, that but I think they're just very sort of robust characters. I mean, well, this is like, sorry, we'll, we'll be finished with this book in a minute, but, uh, <laughs> they, but I think there's sort of like a little bit, there's also like kind of a weird revulsion towards sex. You in know? the book? In the book, it's like somebody takes off their pants and, and the character is like, it was the ugliest thing she'd ever seen in her life. <laughs> oh, okay. there's yeah. a, there is that. And, like, and, and Jacqueline Suzanne, and by the way, um, she's a fascinating character. Yes, there's a, a fascinating there's a, life. There's a uh, biography of her by a, a writer named, sorry, Barbara Seaman. And um, she, and it's, it's a fantastic book. It's really. Aside from the um, Maria Riva's 
biography of her mother, Marlena Dietrich. It's like the best biography I've ever read. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> it's brilliant. And, um, and she was like, she had like all of these fetish, anyway, I, where are we from? So, but, but you know, like, she looked like freaked out books, when yeah. an editor put in the word nipple into her book. And, and she was like, oh, what? that's like an animal. Get that out of there. <laughs> she was just horrifying. Oh, really? Yeah. And she was also like in love with Ethel Merman, which yeah. totally, I mean, which, just, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We probably need to get off. Yeah. Right. I mean, I was going to go into my whole how I'd sneak into my mom's room and read the sex scenes and scruples and you know. Like, do you want scruples? I do you yeah. Friends? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, look, we're we really we're really getting it down the water. All right. So anyway, um, so no, another thing. But I do you think those books influence you? As a yes, writer? hugely because so of how? plot. Because of plot. Because they're, those books are just, they just chug along. Like they have such a, an engine, you know? And, um, and you know, I think back on what were the books. I mean, I'm a very, very embarrassed. Like, Gone with the Wind is such a racist book. And I don't think, like, I realized the full depth of, like, the racism until I went back and read it in college. However, it's the, it is the same aunt. It all goes back to my Auntie Helen. Um, you know, she threw it at me when I was 11 and I was bored. And she was like, read this. It's the best book. It's the best novel ever. And I mean, just the sheer ability of, you know, Margaret Mitchell to, like, keep, you know, just that plot, that story, the idea that a novel could be that big. It's just, you know, similar to Dickens, that you could, like, get all these balls going in the air and, like, keep them spinning and have them develop and... Uh, you know, evolve and have the paths cross. Like, I think, you know, you learn a lot from those kind, of, or I learned a lot from those kinds of books in terms of um, just how to keep it moving, you know, mm -hmm. just how to create energy. On Like, I just read Meg Wolitzer's The Female Persuasion. I mean, she's such a delightful writer. And one of the, you know, one of the strengths, I think, is that, like, her pages are just very energetic. Like, they are just always moving. And I think then the danger with that becomes like, well, what else is your book about? Like, the point should not just be to, like, keep the book moving, mm -hmm. you know? So, but, you know, I'm glad that I kind of have that. I'm not an avant-garde, you know, I mean, I, um, I think, you know, there are novelists that I recognize their brilliance, but I can't really say I've enjoyed them because, you know, the books didn't have that sort of movement, that pace, where you just, like, you feel like you're moving through a world. You know? yeah. Did you? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, like, <clears throat> there are, when books are that popular, whether it's, you know, Gone with the Wind or Ballet of Dolls or something, there's a reason for it. And it's not like somebody's paying these people to read these books. I mean, they have to deliver something on some level. And I think you're right, what they deliver is kind of um, energy and excitement and, you know. And, and also, anyway. Yeah. There we go. So there we are. Okay, so we talked about influences. Okay, so. One thing I want to talk about in this book is that you have a you have a teenage girl, yeah. and um, and the book seems to delve like rather deeply into her social world and her digital social world and and her own inner world. And I was really curious, you know, where that came from. Like, do you have a niece, or did you have friends with like uh, girls that age, or did um, you just sort of re did you just sort of go depth? delve into the world of the social media of teens? That well, I mean, I've been teaching college for 30 years, so, <laughs> you know, I, I have a lot of um, people of that age or around that age, you know, that I interact with on a, on a regular basis. Um, and the rest is a certain amount of um, research, you know, like that. Um, I mean, not much, I'll tell you that. But, um, um, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I think that one of the things about writing these books under a pseudonym that kind of was influential for me was being able to think like, well, I can imagine myself into the life of a, you know, 17-year-old girl, and I'm just going to go for it. Um, and, you know. Have you gotten feedback from girls that age or roughly <laughs> that age? No. <laughs> not not <laughs> at They're mothers. I mean, I've, I've gotten <laughs> from, you know, feedback from mothers of 17-year-old right. girls saying, oh, this is, you know, so realistic and so on, but I'm sure their daughters, A, wouldn't read it, and B, would disagree. But, you know. And B would disagree. But right. if they're not going to read it, then Do you worry about, I feel like increasingly no. at that, no, never. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. um, you're on a Xanax. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
uh, writing characters, I think about this increasingly, you know, writing characters different from me, you know, whether they're not white or whether they're not men, gay men, this has become such an issue, almost to the point where it now seems like there are certain lines that certain writers should not cross, you know. Um, is it something you think about a lot? I mean, I thought about it a lot when I was reading Krista Dorr. Yeah. Um, because you go all over the place with that book. I mean, in terms of age and race and ethnicity and, you know, I mean, so how did you resolve that in your mind? I mean, I felt like when I was writing, I was very aware of these issues of, you know, appropriation that people talk about. Um, I felt like I had worked in that world, like I had worked in AIDS for so long that I was thinking about, I wouldn't say there's a one-on-one -on -one correlation with all the characters, but I was thinking about people I knew and was <laughs> close with. You know, for any one character in that book, there might have been like, with like Isabel, for example, you know, like five women who I know who are kind of in Isabel. And I, so I just um, tried to keep them close, mm -hmm. you know, like as I wrote it. Um, but you know, having said that, quite frankly, I feel like this is such an issue now. Like I feel a much higher sense of um, uh, what trepidation, you know, about writing across like race or something like that. Would you I, do I it differently have. now? Uh, well, it's funny. I was actually telling a friend that like I was like, well, what would it mean to like for my next novel to like stay in my lane? You know, is this phrase that you hear a lot, right? And write just a white novel. You know, like what is that? You know. Um, would it, would it occur to me to write that book in the first place, you know, and, um, you know, because often I feel like I read books like that and I'm like, this is about, like, this writer's world is about this big, mm -hmm. you know, and so I don't know. I mean, I really think it's uh, something, you know, and then, you know, for this book that I have coming out next year, like, I'm half Lebanese, so I have, like, a hold in, you know, the in the Middle East, but it also includes characters who are not Lebanese, who are Iraqi, and, you know, who... Uh, you know, that was pure kind of research, you know, and like seeking people out to talk to. And I have very mixed feelings about it, actually. You know, I don't. How I, do you it, all feel about it? Yeah, we can even. Should we just open it up? Yeah. Should we just open yeah. things up? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said you're writing about a character who's Lebanese. Do you go to the places? Have you been to London? Yeah, yeah, I have, but I haven't been. But a lot of the book is set in Iraq, and I haven't oh. been to Iraq. So it was, I felt like this book was a real uh, half and half for me. Like half, I'm writing about something that I own and that I'm entitled to, and half, you know, taking a, a you know, taking a chance. Um, I had a lot of people, I've had a lot of people read it you know, like I would not. And the same thing with Krista Dora too, like there were certain people that it was really important for me to read the book before it came out when it was, when I was still editing. Mm -hmm. um, and just be like, does this, you know, does this feel, I think it, you know, I think it is because, you know, I feel like I'm writing about people I've known living in New York for 30 years, but you know, what do you say? And, and I got mixed, you know, I got mixed things and I made change, you know, I made some changes based on like uh, feedback that I got. So I wanted to ask you. Um, I want to ask you something about going back to the. Uh, when did you first? When did you start to write? Um, In high school and college. No, after? I mean I, you know kind of. I mean I. I, um, I think it was always kind of like a secret ambition, but it seemed so audacious. I didn't never did it, and then I kind of went to graduate school in Columbia, you know, to get an MFA and. Um, was kind of there that I began doing it a little more seriously. Um, and I kind of had an excuse to write because it was like, it wasn't like, oh, I want to be a writer, it's just I was a graduate student. So. <laughs> okay. And so when you, did you start the object of my affection at Columbia? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when you did, I'm really, so that would have been, it came out in 87, right? Yeah. So imagine that's just like 84, 85? Well, probably even earlier. Okay. So I'm really curious in terms of, um, you know, how conscious were you of like you're writing this book with a gay? Ca it's not from, it's not in the first person. It is. It is from his point of view. Yeah. Right. So you know, how self conscious were you about that at the time? Were you like, this will never be published? Like, there's no, 
I'm trying to remember, I mean, like, that was what a, were your references at that time for maybe the possibility that it could be published? Well, I mean, there, there were, was like, it like, Edmund White? There were books being published um, with gay characters, and, you know, um, what's his name? Um, oh, damn, I'm forgetting, the editor at St. Martin's Press, who had a... Oh, um, yeah, right, he started the Stonewall. Yeah, right. anyway, um, there were books, but most of them, it seemed to me, and not all of them by any means, but many of the most visible ones, like Dancer from the Dance and some of Edmund White's early novels and so on, um, existed very much in a, in a world of um, kind of, I mean, what was totally foreign territory to me of like, you know, clubs and beautiful people and that sort a of very thing. gay world, like in the gay ghetto. I mean in the gay ghetto, but also kind of in, in a particular corner of the gay ghetto, you know, where there was like kind of a, a lot of emphasis on glamour and beauty and you know, that right. sort of thing. Um, so when you wrote The Object of My Affection, yeah. like were, did you very consciously want to write a book where there was a gay character living amid straight people. Well, I that didn't sound so didn't. radical. <laughs> Even in Provincetown, you know, actually. Right, right, right. No, but what I mean is as opposed to a, a, a like no, but I mean, okay, so, dance, so, so I'm just so gay. Yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't that at all. It was just that um, that was not the world that I knew. It was not the world I lived in. I began writing short stories that were set in that world, and obviously they were horrible. You know, because I really didn't know what I was writing about and I didn't particularly care. I mean, it wasn't really a world that, to be honest, it was interesting to me to read it in Dancer from the Dance and Evan White and other places. I love those novels. Um, but it wasn't something that I wanted to be a part of or aspired to in any way or anything else. Um, and just out of kind of defeat, like I was writing all this stuff that just felt so completely inauthentic, um, I kind of went to writing about something that I did know in a world that I was familiar with and that was closer to me um, in many respects and um, people responded to it and so I just kind of continued with that. It wasn't so much like a conscious effort to do anything, um, it was just to tell a story really. Right. And, oh yes, I know another thing I wanted to ask you. I noticed that on the Goodreads, because I have to admit in this hideous age we live in where, where even books are ranked and algorithmed, et cetera, like I do spend a shameful amount of time on Goodreads. Um, you know, I noticed that for your book, like quite a, your book is quite, I mean, I loved it. It's quite pointedly, uh, you know, anti-Republican, anti-conservative. Uh, there's quite, there's a lot of jabs. Yeah. Uh, and but I noticed that you took your lumps for it on Goodreads. You know, a lot of people saying, you know, I, you know, I would have liked this book if it didn't take all <laughs> these gratuitous pot shots at conservatives and religious conservatives, et cetera. And you know, I'm giving him a chance. Like, why won't he give us a chance? And so, you know, I wanted to ask you about, like, have you how much um, blowback or you know, in face to when you went out and did readings, did that ever come up? Um, and how do you how do you feel about it, having been very? You know, I'm not very giving them a chance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I'm like, um, I don't read Goodreads. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I just, and I don't read Amazon. Well, you have your Trumpian detractors on there for, for this. Yay, <laughs> that's a triumph. I'm, I'm happy with that. I mean, and you know, if any of you've read my books, you know that I'm kind of like have a tragic desire to be loved. Um, but, um, you know, if someone, doesn't like it because it has a liberal perspective, then like, they can go fuck themselves. I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't feel like that's really, you know, there, there's, there's a casual, um, uh, I don't know. Contempt no, for conservatives. No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna <laughs> actually, I'm not gonna talk about this. It's just sort of, sort of a plot point that has something that my editor said, well, this is gonna turn off a lot of readers, you know, and I. I said, well, you know, I don't really care. Uh, <laughs> what is it? What block? Oh, it's there's there's mention of abortion in the book, um, and so oh, it's okay. like you know. Okay. Um, but I mean, I don't, you know, no. oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs>
I mean, I think it's one of the the kind of um, problems maybe with 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 this particular novel. Um, the publisher kind of reached out to a bigger audience um, than they had in the past, and you know, there's going to be people who don't like that. And, um, you know, honestly. But I'm just, I mean, I think it's important to be, like, truthful about these characters. These characters live in a world. And you know what, though? Like, most of this novel was written in the spring, summer, and fall of 2016. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When there was, I, there was, like, something going on. I can't remember. What was it? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. But I just, like, did not want to mention that because it was, like, I just kind of enjoyed entering this little world and you know I write longhand in notebooks and oh, really and you know like opening it up and oh I'm in this place where that person doesn't exist you know I mean he does but you know right. nobody's gonna talk about why it. do you write I mean not why but what do you derive from writing longhand in notebooks like does that does does it make the whole thing go slower for you so <laughs> well like, uh, it took eight years, okay? I couldn't go any slower. <laughs> no, 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 but no, I'm really curious. Like, what, what does that feel like to write, in long, to write a novel in longhand? Because I, I can't I imagine it. I highly recommend it. Um, because it is, first of all, my handwriting is um, illegible. And so unlike when you put something on a computer screen, um, <clears throat> you can read it and you want to change the comma from here to here and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's just freeing. You know, and then it gets put into the computer, and then it gets rewritten five times. Do you put times. it in the computer? <laughs> <laughs> do you think I have a transcriptionist? <laughs> I mean, oh, no. so you uh, so then that so that's part of your process of is that you do you trans you type it yeah. from long hand. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And does that become part of the writing process? Does that do you, does, does another layer of writing occur when totally. you do that? Yeah. Totally. And and I don't really like read it even on the page word for word. I just kind of look at it and I know what's there and then I start typing right. it. But you don't get hand cramp though? Like that just sounds painful to me. <laughs> <laughs> Eight years, okay. okay. All right. Oh, I'm I done for love, today. I always love, <laughs> I always, well, I was just that question I always love asking other writers what their rhythm is. Like do you write every day and when and for how long and do you drink coffee or matcha or tea? Or <laughs> yeah, well, okay, I'll answer that question. And then I want to ask you a question about that. And then I think we should yeah. have a question and answer. And if nobody has any questions, then we should just get coffee or tea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but um, but uh, so I write, um, I, I have this pattern now where, so, so when I was writing this novel, I'd written like 90 pages or something, and I sold that. And then I had to write the rest of it. And I came to this library, and I started you know, in the computer. Um, and I thought, OK, I'm going to, and it was like, oh. I spent, you know, like three hours changing a comma from here to there and moving this word and feeling like, oh my God, I'm getting so much done. And but at the, you know, sort of in the middle of the afternoon, I realized I would never finish this book, like never, not by deadline, but never. Um, and so I just wrote a list of scenes that might be in the novel, you know, on, on a, in a notebook. Um, and then every day I went to the library and I just wrote whatever scene I wanted to write. You know, on that given oh, day. Oh, so you wrote it out of order. So I wrote it completely wow. out of sequence, and kind of the mm -hmm. metaphor in my head was like, well, I'm like a documentary uh, filmmaker shooting all this footage, and then I'll worry about assembling it in the, uh, yeah. uh, you know, cutting, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so there's like tons of stuff that didn't get into the book, et cetera, et cetera. See, I think that's incredible. I can't imagine writing a book that but way. But I can't imagine you writing Christodora not that way. Like because it's But so I did and I actually wrote it even so you though wrote it, moves, it, sequentially? it moves around in time I wrote it in the order. With the exception of maybe two chapters that I wrote later and inserted, I wrote it in that order. So like I wrote the two thousand and one chapter first and then I wrote the two thousand and eight chapter and then I wrote the I forgot now. The nineteen eighty one chapter mm -hmm. and then I wrote Yeah, and I mean that's sort of how I, I saw it, you know, like I wanted the first, mm. and it's really funny, I mean, I really feel like that is a real, it's a real toss up whether that style, that out of sequence style, so many people don't like it, you know, like it's really the one thing that, you know, in the comments on the book, and I, I guess maybe it's pathetic for me to admit this, but I do like to read reviews and stuff, because I'm always curious about people's, sometimes people have an insight that never even occurred to me, you know. Um, 
But that is the one thing that came up the most, that people were like, this was just too jangly for me, you know? <laughs> Not everyone, you know? So I sort of said, all right, I'm writing a slightly more challenging book than the, your usual, like, A to Z in sequence. But, but see, I, when, I, when, I read, when I read Christodora, I felt like such kinship with you because I said, oh, I know that he wrote this out of sequence. <laughs> just like, <laughs> Assemble it later. No, There's no that. way that he possibly could have written I this sequentially it. because it sort of goes all. So now I have to rethink my reaction to the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I really love doing that because I feel I sort of going back to something I said before. Like I sort of feel like if you see, okay, like okay, with one character with Hector, right? Like in the very first chapter, you see him and he's a wreck. Like he's so down and out, right? And I think like for me, it was very moving to like go back. 20 years and you see this young, ambitious, smart, like kind of writing it out of sequence like that, like put me in key emotionally with the book, you know, because I wanted the book to be so much about like regret and, um, but you wrote it sequentially as it's, as it's published. I wrote it as it's, re as it reads. As it reads. Yeah, so. with the exception of like two, two chapters yeah. that I felt like there were in that whole timeline, there were a few key moments that I never showed yeah so like I went back and I wrote uh, chapters to put them in but um, yeah but otherwise yeah I just love that well, I mean I'm just obsessed with time you yeah. know like I think I could time I think time is very haunting yeah. you know and um, yeah I mean I always say you know like the chapters that are set in the 80s and stuff like the best birthday present anyone could ever give me would be to just send me back to New York like for one weekend and then the whole thing would be like what year would I pick and exactly where would I go that weekend and you know what a fun exercise yeah so it's a good yeah. dinner yeah. yeah anyway <laughs> should we like open it up yeah hi I think that you, if I understood, I'm sorry I missed the beginning of your talk. If I understood the question about writing not yourself, I think you answered that question in your response to the, to the bit about how the object of my affection came about. Because you place yourself, it seems to me, in the real world, in a place that you love, in a, in, surrounded by people that you understand, and that really came out to me in my ex-life. I mean, more than any of your other stuff, which I've read graciously. Um, and I think that you, it's almost false to try to inhabit a very strict character or group of characters. I think you can't do it. It's not satisfying unless you're talking about all the other people that inhabit your world. Did that make any sense at all? <laughs> um, I, you know, the only thing I heard was I've read all your books. <laughs> <laughs> he just had stars in his and eyes. Yeah. I, think, I think you write other types of people very well, and it's clear that you're as much comfortable in your own skin as you are in an, a keen observer of other people. That's well, thank you very much. I do too. Yeah. 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 I mean, I feel like I should just loop back and say, like, you haven't, if you haven't read my ex-life, it's it's such a delight i mean i just laughed and it's 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 also very moving it's very moving i felt like you know i told him my brother lived in manchester by the sea so i feel like i know those people the slightly finicky constantly restore meticulously restoring their houses yeah. and flipping real estate and but it's just so so funny i mean you can be really quite bitchy when you want and i love it <laughs> Well, I don't know if you. Yeah. A friend of mine who's a writer said, sent me a text yesterday, and he said, I have to replace this one line with like this bitchy comeback. And I thought, oh, I should just write uh. Steve. <laughs> and I couldn't come up with anything. I'm, I'm, you know. Or shade. You can throw some New England shade. <laughs> yeah, can you talk about the, uh, the editing process? And it, how difficult that is as a writer to make changes and, and all of that. Um, so what's the editing process? I mean, you know, this is like the most collaborative book I've ever worked on in that sense, in terms of getting like a lot of editorial feedback. And um, I loved it. I loved it. I'm, I, and, and in a weird way, I have a friend who's a writer who's like, you know, he'll give me something in manuscript and I'll say, well, like, gee, could you change like uh, that word to, um, you know, uh, I don't know, um, 
you know, green instead of blue, and he'll say, but then it wouldn't be my work. And, and I sort of feel like I love the whole collaboration thing, and I love sort of having a, an other eye look at it and m improve it. That's so exciting to me, you know? That's what I love. But what about the publisher, you know, coming from? Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, okay. Look, with, the, with, the, with the editor and, you know, I mean, they, they just want the best thing that there is. And if you, if someone suggests something that seems out of line or inappropriate or something, if it's a, they won't, they'll be fine with that and say, okay, you know, fine. We won't market the book. <laughs> I mean, I think that I think when you have a good editor, a good editor can, a good, you know, who, who was it? Was it Coco Chanel or whatever? The, who always said, take one thing off before you leave the house? Yeah, yeah. Like, a good editor has that eye. You know, like, this isn't serving you. This is weighing you down. And I needed to lose, like, 20% of the book I just finished. And, you know, I love my editor. And I took every single cut. You know, he, he chose all the cuts. And by, you know, I mean, sometimes the 20 or 25 pages. And I took them all. Because if you have a good, you need that eye. You really do. Like, you don't see what's not working, you, the stuff that you might be most wedded to that you love is flat out not working. It's dragging down the book, it's self-indulgent. And you also don't see what you don't have, you know? Like, you don't necessarily see what you need. So, I mean, if you have that person and you trust them, I love just, I'm not, I mean, I've also been a working journalist for 25 years, and if you don't take edits, you don't work. So <laughs> I felt particularly, you know, uh, well-primed to take edits. I'm curious um, if you'd say more about the process of longhand to computer. Like, do you write for a page or a chapter or just till you feel like it? When do you stop and then transcribe into your word processor? Um, so this is like interesting to me, but I'm sure it's not interesting to anyone else. But you mm -hmm. asked the question, so yeah. blame her. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, with this book, I, I just kind of wrote the whole like last four or so hundred pages, um, it's not that long on the page, um, in notebooks. And then when I came to what I felt like was the end, like I was just exhausted <coughs> kind of by it. Um, I just uh, began putting it into the computer. So I kind of wrote, that. so like maybe wrote for like in notebooks for three months or something and then um, started putting it into the computer. And yeah, well, uh, this is for both of you. When you're ensconced in the writing process, not doing the research, do you read books that are about that same era or country, or or do you read do you read more wide? And I'm I'm not talking about your work like teaching, but do you find that you gravitate towards books that are about what you're writing about, or more broad? Um, I mean. I no. Um, I, <laughs> no, you that don't. Was a yes or no question. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I just kind of read whatever I want to read. Okay. Basically, you know, like I was reading when I this summer I was reading this. I was reading another book I'd never read before, which was um, Middlemarch, and I knew that you know, well, I'm not going to be able to. Um, this isn't going to influence me in any direct way. Um, oh, and the other book that I read when I was, was working on this a lot was this book that I became obsessed with called um, The Makioka Sisters by um, Tanazaki, which is this um, uh, Japanese novel, uh, post-war Japanese novel. And, you know, it's a completely different um, style and world and narrative kind of form in a sense. And, but what is pervasive in all those books is just like true in-depth characterization. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, that's important, I think. I did this book I just finished actually I did reams and reams of research like again like I said there's a whole part of the book like set somewhere where I never was which you know I have real mixed feelings about anyone you know who writes you know writes about a place they've never been so I was always usually whatever I was writing I was also reading and researching for like the next chapter uh, which was wonderful I mean the, really one of the pleasures of this book was just all the great books that I read, like, for it. Um, yeah, so, but I mean, in the more general <coughs> sense, hmm, I don't know, I mean, 
I don't know. I always re- I'm reading like I was telling my friend Joe yesterday. I was reading like six books at a time, like three fiction and three nonfiction. And the non I feel like the nonfiction I'm always reading is with an eye toward what I'm writing or what I want to write next. You know, like it just kind of sparks ideas. Um, yeah, but I love this period right now. Of, like I'm actually not like working on something and just. Just reading mm. feels so like delicious. Maybe like what just watching TV is, which I also love, you know. But I, it's just, you know, I really love to, you know, when you're reading not for any reason, but just because. You know. And I really love to read several things at the same time and kind of rotate and not finish it if I don't like it. Yeah. You can do that after you're not in school anymore. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I can't see very well. Uh, Somerset Maugham, in his autobiography, The Summing Up, talks about writing in longhand. And he says, in effect, he talks about the heft, or the, the weight, as it were, of the pencil or the pen in his hand as he is writing. There's a whole kinesiology of writing in longhand that is totally different from typing or com- writing on a computer or anything else like that. Do you find that to be so? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, even down to like fetishizing certain notebooks, yeah. you know, <laughs> like I, if anyone wants a recommendation of some really great notebooks that are very expensive but kind of worth it, um, I got a bunch of them. Um, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so, yeah, and, 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 and even like just the way the pen glides across the page, you know. Um, uh, somehow it engages the flow of your thoughts. Yeah. You, you can write and organize and see ahead at this all, all simultaneously. Yeah. That's, that's great. I, I highly recommend it too. You know, you know what you're writing and you know what you're going to write. Yeah, or it just connects you to it in a way yeah. that feels kind of, I don't know, more this one also. We take one more question and then. I loved all three characters, Julie, David, Mandy, but I really liked Mandy. Do you ever write a character and are surprised by it and then want to not write a sequel, but kind of morph her or morph the character into a future novel? Or did, did you have a favorite of the three? You know, I love um, the. Um, some of Larry McMurtry's novels, um, who kind of did this thing where he took a character from an earlier novel and then he made them the main character and so on. And um, I, you know, if I were more prolific, I would consider that. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's, uh, but I don't know. I, I, I actually, um, I mean, do you think about your characters when you're finished with a book? Or? Yeah, I love my characters. <laughs> and I think it's a good. You know, I think like that's one of the most gratifying things is like this, this love for them that you develop and you know this closeness. And um, I think you know, I think he just walked out of this gentleman right here. Well, he said something about writing about people who you love. Mm-hmm. You know, I find that's a very gratifying way of, in a, some weird way, like showing love for people in your real life that you you can't tell them for one reason or another, you know. I mean, I find that I do that a lot. I find that, like, I'm thinking about certain people and feeling very loving toward them, like, when I'm writing these characters that are somewhat based on them, because I don't really believe in, like, writing a one-on-one. I just think that's really tacky and, you know. Um, But I like to be thinking about real people, like, three levels below the character that I'm writing. Um, And, uh... Yeah, and so I think partly, like, I developed this affection for them. And also, like, writing characters who are kind of a jerk at first, you know, and then you, you know, I feel like... In There's Christ- a lot of that in Christmas. Yeah, Power. yeah, no, there is. Like, you yeah, know, there people is. that are, you under- they're difficult to love, but you understand them sufficiently well so that you understand what's motivating their behavior and yeah. what's behind their defenses. And some of the, particularly some of the secondary characters were really characters that I want, you know, which I thought was very true to, like, all these years in you know in writing reporting on or being in activism you know there are very like activism is very abrasive you know there's a lot of extremely abrasive personalities you know and it's only over the course of years where you're working with them for this common thing that like you develop like 
you know, I don't know if anyone saw B there's this amazing movie called BPM. Oh, it's that about movie is incredible. It's so amazing, isn't it? It's, it's about it's about act it's about AIDS activism in Paris in the nineties. Aaron insisted, right? Or no. Right. Someone you did. Thank you. What, that you guys see it? Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't yeah, it? But I wanna you know, when one of the activists says to the other, you know, he says he's in the hospital and he's like, Look, why are you here? And he goes he goes, We don't like each other but we're friends. Right. Like mm -hmm. is the essence of actors, you know, and I I really wanted to capture that in Crystal Dora that like it the it, you know, for those who survived, like you went through this thing together and it doesn't matter like how much you uh fought or disagreed, you know, at the time. It's like you experienced something together that nobody else did. Right. And that, you know, and in later life that kind of binds you and so, you know. Well thank you. Thank you very much.